Kevin today. Well, what I'd like to do is really give you uh, my take on uh, looking at uh, dealing with uh, eutrophication, looking at how we can use biological organisms uh, to uh, remediate coastal waters. And the term that I've uh, developed is a term called nutrient bioextraction, where we're using extractive organisms to remove nutrients. Extractive organisms in aquaculture are uh, shellfish and seaweeds. And there are different types of seaweeds. Uh, if we look at uh, global areas of seaweed production, right now uh, we are uh, globally uh, Okay. Well, when we look at global uh, seaweed production, uh, today, according to FAO statistics, we are producing around 35 to 36 million metric tons globally. Between 95 and 98 percent of that production is taking place in Asia. Uh, the opportunities that we have to increase production has to do with other oceans of the world. And these areas are areas of North America and Europe, including Scandinavia. But you know, the, the question you ask yourself, the United States has an exclusive economic zone of over 11 million square kilometers. That's the second largest exclusive economic zone in the world. Our land mass is only 9 million uh, square kilometers. And so we have an opportunity to use, to do cultivation of different types of seaweeds of economic value in our coastal waters. And if we cite seaweed aquaculture in near shore environments, we have a particular opportunity to uh, grow the seaweeds extract the nutrients, and when you're doing this, you're, you're creating economic gain, uh, economic gain dealing with the farmers who will be participating. And so uh, when you have the private sector participating in an activity, we have a very nice opportunity in the U.S. And starting in 2008, 2009, I decided that we had to start doing something in the U.S. Uh, with seaweed cultivation. We just can't uh, believe on uh, leaving behind the opportunities in our initial environments. And so I started making open source manuals, cookbooks as I called them. And I did that for the general public. I did that also for the scientific community. I uh, decided to use technology like YouTube, made videos because some people don't like to read books. So we had videos. And then I just uh, provided that to the public, worked with uh, private sector farms, uh, in particular up in coastal Maine, later in the Gulf of Alaska, and we really have now started a seaweed industry. Well, when we take a look at the seaweed industry, this is really an overview of where we are right now in the United States. We're importing over 16 million uh, uh, dry pounds of seaweed, uh, wet pounds of seaweed, over 16 million. Uh, that really is something that we can do a better job. Growing our own seaweeds that have economic value for foods, beans, for nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, cosmeceuticals in the United States. We don't have to import that. We have our coastal zone, even though it's crowded, we have a coastal zone that can be uh, divided up where you can actually have your recreational boating, which is principally during the spring through the fall, but then in the winter months, you have an opportunity to uh, perhaps perform seaweed aquaculture. So this is just an overview of giving you where we stand right now. Uh, in 2009, we set up the first seaweed farm up in the uh, Portland, Maine area there, no production in the United States. Uh, the United States subject and register on uh, the FAO list. Uh, today, uh, we're looking at production in the United States there, uh, well over 2 million uh, pounds of seed. 
and it's growing exponentially, as I will show you uh, in a moment. So when we take a look at Long Island Sound area, uh, this is an area that I have a particular interest to for 18 years. I was a science co-chair of the Long Island Sound programs of the US EPA. I understand coastal management, and coastal management doesn't work in a vacuum. In order to be successful, you have to have public buy-in, you have to have private sector. And so we propose uh, this whole concept of using biological organisms to help and assist to remove nutrients and coastal waste. I term this uh, uh, process nutrient bioextraction. And nutrient bioextraction, when I termed it, was really an offshoot of something that I've been involved in at the global scale, scale called integrated multi-tropic aquaculture, where as we expand fish aquaculture, we have problems. Uh, fish do one thing, besides zinc, they also poop. And they have a lot of liquid waste as well as solid waste. Well, we did some experiments up in uh, the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we moved some seaweed farms by fish farms, and then we developed this whole process where we can actually uh, site with fish farms, seaweed farms, as well as shellfish farms, because uh, seaweed and shellfish are extractive organisms. Seaweeds take up inorganic nutrients, shellfish take organically bound uh, nutrients. So this concept of nutrient bio extraction is really a very simple concept, but it's very important. And what we're looking at now, this issue of non price source nutrients, how do you get a handle on that? So really it's the culmination of both macroalgae and shellfish. And what do we have here in the East End of Long Island? You have shellfish aquaculture. And so if you can work with your shellfish aquaculture and also give the folks in that industry the opportunity to do seaweed cultivation, especially at times of the year that they're not doing shellfish, you have this opportunity to take up nutrients. And we can do this nutrients by as we're growing our shellfish, growing our seeds, that the removal of the biomass to extract the nutrients from coastal waters. And this can also deal with the legacy of nutrients that are in the sediments for a long period of time. And so when we're looking at our coastal waters, the uh, Long Island Sound study, working with the ENGOs in the region there, uh, looks at the number one problem, which is nitrogen. And we can see hypoxia as you're going westward in Long Island Sound uh, to the East River there, increases problems. And those problems there need resolution. And you can't just expect uh, the resolution coming from your sewage treatment plants. They're stressed enough. We have to look at innovative ways of doing it. And when we look at the grades of our coastal waters, our coastal waters, as you go in further west, really uh, degraded. But that's also where the people are. And so we have to understand we've got to think out of the box. And nutrient bio extraction really is an opportunity to think out of the box. We look at the Long Island Sound estuary. We have areas of agriculture and lawn that goes into eventually the coastal waters, river system streams, the rivers, river systems into. Uh, our estuarine areas there. We have wastewater treatments. They're doing um, much better than they had done uh, 20 years ago. Many of the wastewater treatment uh, uh, systems have reached their target TMDLs. And when we take a look, we have this uh, situation of atmospheric deposition actually raining down on the waters of the New York metro area. And where does that come from? That comes from the Midwest. And so that is not my source. So how do we get out of handle on all these uh, different uh, sources of nitrogen? I, well, I'd like to say up front, uh, my sponsors have been many over the years, and I have to credit the EPA uh, taking a chance on some of the things that I've started. And I would really like to say, 30 years ago, I had a workshop here at Stonebrook University. I proposed managing eutrophication by cultivation of seaweeds. Nobody was listening to me. I, I loved it at the time. And I remember my friend, Jerry Schubel, who is the dean and director of MSRC, 
uh, and said to me, Try, nobody's going to buy this stuff. And, uh, you know, now I look at three decades later, uh, Jerry is at the was at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and he says, Well, you really started something. You got an industry growing. And, you know, great, that's fantastic. We have an opportunity to do things here uh, in our region. So I propose three open water farm systems. And the open water farm systems, one was at the mouth of the Brown River Estuary. I can say today that mouth of the Brown River Estuary was the East River. I couldn't say it before because I was told, well, with the Brown River Settlement Fund that's providing some monies uh, for the project. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation was also supportive. Working with the Long Island Sound Study, we had support also of the Connecticut uh, and the New York Sea Grant programs there. So we established uh, three farm sites, the far uh, western end of the Sound, uh, which was uh, in an area uh, off the Bronx. We also had one site in the western area of the Sound, uh, right off Fairfield, Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and then one site in the Central Basin. Uh, this was a site in the Thimble Islands, which were beautiful archipelago of islands in Long Island Sound off the Connecticut coast. So when we take a look at our uh, seaweeds, and if we take a look at our nutrients, what they do we find? Nutrients in the water all the time. We got to deal with them. They're in the summer, they're in the winter. Higher sulfur and nutrients are normally uh, in the winter months, but they are very high even in the summer months uh, in the New York metro area. So I propose after we develop cookbooks and how to cultivate, we have to work with native species. Opportunities are, are there working with native species and we develop the cultivation technologies of a red seaweed called grass malaria. It's found in all the estuaries of New York metro area. And uh, it is uh, very, very common. It's doing ecosystem services, whether you know it or not, uh, in those areas, the problem is it sits there. And when it sits there, it degrades. And so you and it goes into hypoxic situations. But if you can cultivate it, why not? If you cultivate it, you can remove it. And so I don't like to, uh, you know, show lots of data, but I like to show things. I learned something working in China with my colleagues here. Seeing is believing. Right there, we put out little bundles of grass malaria the size of the fish, maybe 20 grams, and we put it on lines that are 100 meters in length. And in two weeks, two and a half weeks, we had uh, growth rates of 16 and a half percent per day. And notice the bundles, that bottom picture, all the one in the upper uh, right hand corner. Those bundles sit the size of a soccer ball. You also notice there they are they were cultivated on lines. There's no contaminating organisms there. It's pretty clean. And people say you can do it. You can strip. I love it when people say you can do it, and if you show them you could do it, and you're not even getting contaminants, we had success. And this was important. This opened up everybody's eyes on the opportunities for nutrient bio extraction. Uh, one thing that I strongly believe in, besides all the source documents, you have to have your work peer reviewed and published. And so we published our work on, our, on the grass area, a very good summer species. And so when we take a look at our nitrogen removal at, at two of our sites there, you can see the nitrogen removal in the, uh, at the, in the Bronx, as I said before, that is the uh, the East River, the mouth of the Bronx River Estuary. Uh, you can see the differences between years. Uh, you can also see the difference between sites. When you have high levels of nutrients, some seaweeds can really suck those nutrients out of the water very quickly. Now, in Asia, you've got blooms now of green seaweeds. You've probably heard about blooms of brown seaweeds invading the Caribbean. Well, these are natural populations, and why are they growing rapidly and forming blooms? Nitrogen, that's the point. So, in areas like the East River, we had some of the largest sewage sheeple plants there, and a legacy of nitrogen pollution descendant, there's an opportunity. In the areas of Long Island Sound, notice much less uh, nitrogen removal, but still, it's nitrogen removal. 
So when we take a look at uh, our spacings of lines there, if we develop our seaweed farming systems, our long lines, and we space these lines about four meters apart, which today I can tell you we've done work at one meter apart, which is even better, uh, you get significant production. So the amount of nitrogen removal per hectare that's in that water uh, that gave growth at six and a half percent per day, gave growth uh, high levels of growth in the month of July, little less in August, uh, less in September, little less in October, still significant. It's removing nitrogen in the water. Long Island Sound, more consistent because the levels of nutrients are much less in that area. So when we look at gracilarity, a spring, summer, early fall species there, it has the capacity to remove nutrients. And so when I look at the capacity of growing gracilaria in Long Island Sound, uh, basically we worked with some GIS maps of the sound, areas where I felt you can grow gracilaria uh, and areas that are not suitable for gracilaria because of conflicts there. We came up with estimates of the amount of space that would be potentially available. Doesn't mean you have to use it all, but here is another tool in the toolbox for the coastal managers and bringing in the private sector that would be involved in doing the cultivation. What can you do with the grassland area? Uh, if it's in waters that are so-called polluted or problematic, well, you can use that grassland area in uh, a fertilizer supplement. You can use that grassland area. Uh, and extract different chemicals from that, which would destroy any poten uh, potential pathogenic organisms there. Uh, you can use that grassland area as a feed. Uh, you can extract out from the grassland area a substance called agar. And there's a shortage of agar in the world markets today. And then if you have so much biomass, you know, big bundles of biomass, uh, you can move it into animal feeds, and it is going in animal feeds today. And of course, the U.S. Department of Energy says, oh, give me your biomass, and we want to produce biofuels. Once the price of oil is $120 a, uh, a barrel, uh, that's when seaweed cultivation really takes off uh, with the opportunities that we have. So gives you an idea of the expected production based on real-world information for this region. And so uh, nutrients are in the water all the time. And in the winter months are the highest. And this was really, I felt, uh, the most opportune species we can use in this region. And this is a kelp. This is a brown seaweed. Uh, it's called sugar kelp. It's native to the region. Uh, the southernmost distribution today uh, of sugar kelp actually is the New York metro area. It did extend at one time uh, off the coast of New Jersey, but because of climate change, kelp is a cold water species, uh, those populations were lost there. But kelp is very fast growing, and it's in the news quite a bit. Uh, you'll see stories about the kelp production there. It's one of the uh, most important species now uh, in North America for uh, cultivation. Uh, economically very valuable, uh, as well as in Europe and Scandinavia. And what kelp can do as it's growing, and keep in mind the economic uses are valuable, it has the ecosystem service of extracting nutrients from the coastal waters. So here are some uh, images here of some of our first kelp farms. And this is uh, this picture right over here. Uh, what about farm right off uh, the area of Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, by Fairfield, and notice the wall of kelp that we were producing. Uh, we produce 17 kilos per meter of long line. By the way, 17 meters per kilo of long line is actually equal to production in China per meter of long line, or Korea and J uh, Japan. We hit it right on the nose. And it was very straightforward there. And uh, this would give us an understanding. Yes, we could do it. And when we came to do it, you know, in some of our areas of Long Island Sound, uh, I was told you'll never be able to do that in the East River. 
And I remember going through the permitting process to get a research uh, permit. Uh, everybody told me why you couldn't do it. And I said, well, give me a chance to see if I can do it. And using the techniques we had developed and perfected up in uh, Southern Maine there, well, we started putting in our, we put our long lines in, we poured a raft down to all the well, shellfish off that. And uh, on our East River farm, uh, we were able to show that we were able, we were able to extract anywhere from 46 to 87 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, depending on the spacing of the lines. And if we look at the uh, nutrient bio extraction by the kelp, not only is nitrogen being removed, but also you have carbon dioxide removal. Uh, what's the big issue today with carbon dioxide? Ocean acidification. So growing this one seaweed in large quantities in areas that could be uh, where the seaweed will grow, including the East River, uh, where you have high levels of nutrients there, uh, we show that you can have uh, seaweed production. Notice the images on the bottom. That's actually the images are our kelp farm right in the East River. A wall of kelp. Once again, we had similar production in the East River as we had in one of the other sites in Long Island Center. Uh, we actually published the data for the kelp and we made our estimates. It was one of the keystone papers for early uh, opportunities for kelp production for urbanized estuaries like Long Island Sound. So estimated Long Island Sound production, once again, uh, looking at where we can actually grow it in Long Island Sound, uh, and we can see areas of suitable, not suitable. We can actually produce an awful lot of kelp in Long Island Sound. And that's an opportunity. Does it mean you're gonna carpet the area? No, you can actually grow it in areas that will be sensitive for other competing industries, whether it's shipping, recreational fishing, and I'm a recreational fishing person, so I understand that. And working with the National Ocean Service and the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, the U.S. Uh, the National Ocean Service has developed a thematic program called Aqua Map. It's great for the coastal zone of the United States. It also looks at the exclusive economic zone, and it takes all the competing interests in our near shore and offshore environments, and you can put a rectangle, a rectangle any place you want, and you can see the suitability based on some of the initial suitability work that we've done in Long Island Sound. You can see the suitability for the cultivation of the seaweeds, I think, at time of the year. And it also includes military, which is important because. You know, we do have military traffic uh, in our coastal zone, and we have to be sensitive to that, not to impede that. So, an opportunity. How does that stand for nutrient bio extraction of seaweeds? We have a summer species, we have a winter species. The summer species it doesn't produce as much biomass as the winter one, but the winter one uh, is a winning uh, species there. It's at a time when the the water's not being used very much in the winter. So why not use that opportunity? It's also a time January and February when this, when the kelp are growing is recreational boning and competing interests are really uh, diminished. So you can remove nitrogen by producing the biomass. You can remove CO2. This is important. And when we look at how we are doing the Long Island Sound by growing, seaweeds in the spring uh, and, the, and summer and fall and into the winter, uh, you can see uh, we stack up very, very nicely when you add sugar kelp and grass larry, the red seaweed that I was talking about, very nicely for extracting nutrients. That's a tool in a toolbox for a coastal manager. But it's being driven by the private sector. And I am a strong believer of private sector involvement needs to be done all the time. And so when we started our work, I was told why we couldn't do it. And today you can see here from the initial work that we did here in the New York metro area, we, had, we set up the techniques for growing red seaweed. That's being used globally now. Also for kelp, 
used globally. There are 10,000 downloads of our cultivation manuals, according to Google Scholar, that uh, are sitting at the UConn libraries, because that's the open source manuals that I know that people can have access to. So where does that go? The US government saw the opportunity as well. And they realized and looked at the future, we're gonna have problems with fuel that we see it today. You know, the price of fuel has gone up exponentially. And back in the 1980s, we had a biomass program and Stony Brook University was one of the lead institutions doing the biomass for, uh, pro in the biomass for, uh, program. But the problem was the price of fuel, the barrel of oil, precipitously dropped because I got to be honest with you, uh, the folks in Saudi Arabia realized that if you had started investing in biofuels, uh, their value of oil is going to be diminished. So uh, the, the cost went down. We, very, we were very complacent. And now we're seeing what's happening with our complacency and the need for getting more sources of biofuel. But the Department of Energy in 2017 came to me and said, what can we do with uh, potentially resurrecting a biomass program in the United States? And I went into all the reasons why biofuels was not what I was interested in. I was interested in uh, expanding an industry that provided a good fuel, uh, food product a food product that didn't require land, a food product that didn't require fresh water, didn't require fertilizer. I said, that's where we are right today. We have entrepreneurs, we have farmers involved. We're developing this industry. I don't want to uh, destroy the industry by producing so much commodity on the market. And they said, we understand that. But as we understood that, uh, we developed a program working with the Department of Energy's RPE program, a moonshot for seaweed cultivation, $62 million. Initially started off at 28, but as the projects became more successful in the United States, uh, the, the expanded program. And it was a program called the Mariner Program. Mariner refers to macro algae research, inspiring novel energy resources. This is a U.S. program. And when we look at this program, it is scalable, cost efficient, and it's got to be cost competitive, and we want sustainable biomass production. Well, we didn't have all the tools to really expand seaweed cultivation in the U.S. We can't follow the methodologies that are people intensive what they use in Asia. And we also have to respect our coastal zone. And so we are doing that when we look at the Mariner program. And as I said before, we have a very large exclusive economic zone. Uh, the opportunity to use that exclusive economic zone for producing biomass. At the end of the day, the Mariner program, when it was actually advertised in 2018 and the first projects uh, came out there, the goal was to produce 500 million uh, dry metric tons of macroalgae per year. That's a huge goal, you know, as I said before, uh, today global production is at 35 million, maybe 36 million metric uh, uh, tons of uh, seaweed production. But it's at that level, 500 million dry, multiplied by, by 10, that gives you wet. That is the scale where you impact also something called global climate change. That's the scale of activity. And you can't do it in the offshore environments. You have to do it in the offshore environment. So we have to develop technologies in the offshore environment. So there are values for expanding the cultivation and doing it in a tech uh, country like ourselves there or in Western countries in Europe as well as Scandinavia there. We have to make sure it's market relevant uh, for the production. You start off with baby steps and then you increase your production levels there. Working in the offshore is a challenge. I know when I took a submersible back in 1987, I was on this little yellow submarine, the one that you see on the picture of the old Beatles album. And I went into a two person sub. I was dropped 65 miles off the coast of uh, Atlantic City and I said, I'm going to explore this kelp growing on a rig 
that was called the Texas Tower Four platform that collapsed uh, back in the storm in uh, 1961. And I got lowered into the sea. Well, before I could get lowered into the sea, we had to be able to stay on site. And I experienced 60 foot waves. And I said, oh, if I'm gonna think about in the future doing something, offshore is a tough area. So you gotta develop new technologies there, new farm structures uh, to be able to handle that biomass. And these are the tools that Mariner has really set out to develop. Tools for producing autonomous vehicles because we can't put people out in harm's way. And we're dealing with autonomous vehicles on surface waters and also on the water. We're dealing with tools where we could uh, actually model our farm systems before we put them out and working with the US Department of Navy and uh, the private sector modeling. We've done an awful lot of that. And then we have to understand that if we're looking for a new drop, terrestrial agriculture, 10,000, 15,000 years, we've been you know, domesticating crops. And here, uh, we want to do a crop for North America. So we got to domesticate that. And uh, the Mariner program has two major breeding programs, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. The East Coast deals with the sugar kelp that I've talked about. The West Coast deals with the giant kelp. And these breeding programs there have some of the best and brightest scientists involved uh, on the uh, sugar kelp as well as the uh, giant kelp. And I must say, I wanted to bring in plant and breeders. I want to take advantage of plant breeders. And so one institution in the state of New York is one of the top plant breeding institutions globally, Cornell University. We brought Cornell into the program after I had a visit with, with faculty there and they had an interest of using some of their techniques and sharing it with us in the seaweed world. And we applied those techniques now for growing seaweeds and particularly the kelps. And that's another part of the breeding program, another part of the Mariner program. And then offshore farm designs, uh, we also have developed that as well. And there is something else that is going to be important. As I said before, I'm a strong believer in private sector. Government can't do it all. Government sets a path. Yeah, you know, it takes initial risk, and that's what RPEO is about, uh, taking that risk. But then we have to understand the tech to market opportunities. And the tech to market opportunities there are outlined in this slide panel, but it is economic system services. I remember when I brought this up to the Mariner program as it was being developed, they looked at me, we're not interested in ecosystem services. I said, I'm interested in it, but if you want the opportunity to use some of the techniques that I suggest, ecosystem services are relevant for coastal communities. And today you're hearing about what happens to those nutrients that are not catching that go from the groundwater into the initial environments, that's a non-point source uh, pollution. Ecosystem services like nutrient bioextraction is that opportunity, it's real. And I've done it here, not only for North America, I've done that also in China, teaching my colleagues there about better management of their coastal zone. And especially in, in South Korea, where I have a very close uh, relationship as well. So tech to market opportunities are important. So what are some of those activities that are now being invested with your tax dollars at the federal level? The Moonshot, the Mariner program. And I'm just gonna show you a couple. One is a scalable uh, uh, cultivation of kelp. And uh, we could have done it on the East Coast. We could have done it on the West Coast, but uh, the Mariner program wanted to do it on the West Coast in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, they felt permitting would be a little bit easier to do it. And so here we are, uh, most of the scientists involved in the project come from the East Coast, from my lab, from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, from Cornell University, uh, 
also private sector modeling operations there. But we've developed scalable farming in Alaska. And you can see that picture on the left hand side. That's kelp cultivation. That's production. That's production after five and a half months of growth. Five and a half months. Most of the kelp grows in late February, March, and April, and early June. That's when the cultivation is maximum. When the lights go on in the spring, kelp take off. When did the kelp get their nutrients normally? In the dead of winter. They sequester the nutrients in their tissue. And so when the lights are on, they use their own internal levels of nitrogen, except for that very unique group uh, area of this region, the East River, where you have very high levels throughout the summer, the kelp doesn't have to worry of sequestering that they can still get their nitrogen. But up in the Gulf of Alaska, we develop scalable farming. And we have a whole cast of characters of individuals. So, you, you know, this is a tremendous amount of cooperation, other institutions there, besides the institutions that are on the East Coast. We also have a private sector company uh, called Blue Evolution, which is the first company, first company uh, to bring uh, seaweed farming in Alaska. It's also the largest producer of kelp in Alaska. They went through all the permitting issues in the state here from the private sector, and they're an important partner uh, for us. Uh, we also have an organization uh, called Green Wave Organization. A green, green Wave Organization founded here on the East Coast is farmers helping farmers to expand the production of different types of seaweeds. Uh, recently, the Green Wave Organization, in the spirit of openness, has created an online hub. And this online hub, you can get your feet uh, tested. You want to be a farmer of particular seaweed. And of course, there is business planning on this online hub. It's a great opportunity that Green Wave has done on the West Coast, on the East Coast. And we've had some very successful work. And I can't say enough about these two folks. These are the farmers. And here in Long Island, you have had some farmers working with Chris Goble and Mike Dole and SVU. They're the backbone. You've got to get these folks to know the city. Uh, and in this region, those displaced lots of men, because the lots of migrated further north, are an opportunity. The shell fishermen, they know the sea, they have the boats there, they know the opportunity. These are the guys that really help us as scientists. And also, they are, as they do their uh, farming, uh, they tell us and they help us correct our systems. And so, uh, there we have a, a kelp from one of our farms there, my friend Mike Steckel from the University of Alaska. Uh, and if you're interested in the story, of seaweed cultivation in the U.S. I can't say enough about this particular paper. This really describes the U.S. effort. It was recently published in, two, in 2019. It will give you a good understanding of the do's and the don'ts, why you can do it in certain areas, why you can't. A very good summary paper for that. So what about that scalable production that we had? Well, we went from a simple long line opportunity, we develop cantonary systems, multiple lines in a system, not one, but five. Multiple lines that can be spaced the way you want. Uh, we, we space them not at uh, five meters and 10 meters, now we space them at one meter. And the picture up the left, that's one of our production systems. And we have 80 lines right there. And when you're dealing with any lines, you've got to develop technology to reduce the seed. And you can't just work with donor populations. So we got to develop seed banks as well, just like we have seed banks in the terrestrial area. We have developed seed banks in uh, the, the uh, seaweed world as well. And as you can see, the modeling by Kelsey uh, and Associates on the bottom, that's some of our uh, program our our farm systems that have been modeled in tank systems and obviously using artificial intelligence to tell us how our system will withstand. 
And in any case, we have not lost any of our production system in the winters of the Gulf of Alaska. That's amazing when we look at that. And you can see the production there. Uh, why Alaska? We have a fishing fleet that sits idle from November until usually early May. And so we're retrofitting some methods now in Alaska and seaweed cultivation and shellfish cultivation are the fastest growing industries in Alaska and the investments the state of Alaska has made in this area now exceed over $50 million. And that's in addition to some of the federal investments that we're talking about. We can produce in the US at the level of production of other countries in the world. We can do it using technology, smart technology. We can do it with autonomous vehicles. And we're experimenting with that. And if you look at some of our production systems there, uh, just over a, a two-year period there, you can see when we went from a harvest field of uh, 26,750 kilos there, uh, we went up to uh, well over 55,000 kilos. We actually had exceeded that the following year. Our cost per hectare uh, basically have diminished as well. Uh, we're becoming much smarter. And the labor cost is also smarter. And that is important. And so this is the opportunity using technology that has been supported by the U.S. government. It's open source technology. It is available through the Mariner program. And I just can't encourage people enough to take a look at some of the work there. The breeding program, as I mentioned, with domesticating cattle, And that's part of my crew uh, from Yukon and also from Woods Hole there. My colleague, Scott Lindell, who I brought in from the fit, uh, from the shellfish world in 2009 into the seaweed world. I asked him to be the PI of the project. I wanted somebody who should be around a little bit longer than myself. And so being realistic, we put together this screening program. Uh, we, we went up and down the coast and we got representatives of the germ plasm of the entire life of New England. This is important. And we had to determine because regulators wanted us to know are the, are the cattle that are found in on the coast of uh, New England, including the middle of the state, are they all the same or are they different? You don't want to move things around unless you know something about it. So we started doing genetic studies. And what we determined, the, there are uh, plants, kelp plants, populations that are south of Cape Cod. They are different genetically than ones north of Cape Cod. They are south of Cape Cod or actually have a higher thermal tolerance than north of Cape Cod. And we had to determine that. We've also developed a seed bank uh, for that. Uh, we have 1,200 unique cultures. Recently, we moved them into the National Culture Center of Marine Algae at the Bigelow Ocean <coughs> Science Labs. We wanted Liddell and I and the Mariner Pro, we want those cultures to be available for that represent south and north of Cape Cod. And so when we look at that, uh, let's see if we can get this slide to drop right here. Uh, this is uh, what we do. We actually have two demonstration farms, one in Long Island Sound to work on the Southern New England population. Another one in the Gulf of Maine. And we put out our farm in December, and then in May, early June, we harvest. And we measure all the different courses that we have put out. And we measure all the different plants that we put out, because this is really sound science. We want to know uh, that information. And at the end of the day, when we look at that, you know, we had great plants. And by the way, we were active during COVID. It was difficult, but we were monitored our farms and we were able to get some very good data. And I just wanted to show this of, of all our 50 or 60 different characteristics, measuring whatever you can imagine inside the tissue of the kelp. Uh, we also, at the end of the day, were interested in biomass production. And notice we were able to get in our systems 17 kilos per meter. 
We are going to have to get up at 28 kilos per year. That is, uh, after three years of breeding, that is somehow 28 kilos per meter. We have many plots that are efficient at 20 kilos per meter. That is productive. So between the scale of farm system that you saw in Alaska and the, the process of developing new, uh, uh, developing uh, the seed bank, the germplasm there, uh, this has been very important. And you can see some of our plants. Uh, we are able to reduce some of our plants uh, after five months. Uh, some of these plants can be nine to 10 meters in length. That's our fast growing plants. High biomass production. That excites the Department of Energy because they say, hey, we invested in research is giving us after three years the opportunity now to say we domesticated uh, the uh, material. And also, as I said before, we go through and we measure a lot of different internal characteristics. I did the same thing uh, in the kelp farms and that we worked on in Long Island Sound. So we don't have our head in the sand. But notice what I put up first, CHN, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. To me, that was the number one issue in growing up in the New York metro area. Growing up in the Long Island Sound area, we identified nitrogen. I always put that up front. Looking at sugar production is important because hopefully sugars can be converted into uh, biofuels as well as other products. Uh, looking at uh, protein content, the ash content are also important uh, for us. Looking at the contaminants, we have to understand there are contaminants there. And as a spin-off of this program, I was able to get the WWF, World Wildlife Fund, involved down into seaweed farming globally. And they recently formed a partnership with the National Institute of Standards, NIST, yeah, in Washington to basically to develop proficiency testing of laboratories. So in the United States, so we can see what are the best methods for measuring all these things. Just don't depend on a government lab to give you all the answers. So we wanted to bring private sector labs in and, and come up with proficiency testing. The WWF uh, has worked on a program uh, with that. We've also developed a database. We have big data, big data that is, uh, has to be analyzed. And we developed something called Telebase. People in the plant breeding environment have big databases as well. Well, Cornell helped us develop this Telebase database. And the US Department of Energy is so excited about this database uh, right now, they want our other breeding tools to be used well, because it gives us a good opportunity to track what we are doing. So we know the gains each year, what's going on. That is important. And we can see these investments as they are taking place. We are using modern molecular methods to drive our production systems. And I have to say, we are using, we are not using any genetically modified organisms. We're harnessing the natural variation in our kelp on the East Coast to West Coast. Now, in the future, we plan to do some uh, modification, but the modification is something so far out the box. We are, we are working on looking at mutations that would confer sterility on our germplasm. We work with our germplasm. We, we have genotyped it. We develop what we call a reference genome. We put our males and females together. We get those big, tall kelp plants. And what we found out, we can actually go into the genome, look at the mutations, and we can form sterile crops. And right now, we have experiments uh, in the Gulf of Maine for sterility. And this has been done by looking at the genetic structure of our plants. So this is the opportunity. And today, as I bring back, private sector is important. What makes the private sector interested? Yes, they're gonna give you ecosystem services 
and as you know, the ecosystem services are going to help everybody, but look at the opportunities in the private sector that you have. This whole idea of using all the kitchen of the seaweed is referred to as a biorefinery. And the biorefinery makes sure at the end of the day, everything is used. And everything is used from the ecosystem services uh, at different points right there to produce biomass that has economic value. When you're dealing with biochemicals, biofuels, and so forth, there is the opportunity for doing that with seaweed cultivation. Started in the New York metro area from a guy from Brooklyn who basically grew up, understands the near shore issues here, but this is really important. And so when I look at what's going on, I, I got to go back to, you know, New York. And when we look at New York, uh, let's see. Nope, I guess it's not going to play the, uh, the audio file that I had embedded in here. But uh, I would say this, if you can do it in New York, you can do it anywhere. Frank Sinatra was right uh, there. That is the production of the kelp farm that we had there in the East River. We also grew uh, mussels in the East River there. It got, it got people's attention once we did it in New York. And I remember showing pictures like this to folks over in uh, the UK, uh, Spain, Portugal, Scandinavia, uh, people saw what we were doing in our region and everything is open source, so it's available. Thank you.